Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Laying a Solid Foundation for Your Cloud in AWS. Thank you for attending. My name is Joanna Williams, and I'm the Marketing Assistant at Unicon. I will be facilitating today's webinar, which features an overview of the essentials to establishing a secure, manageable, and scalable Amazon Web Services infrastructure by Marcus Lewis and Dave Mendez. Marcus Lewis fills numerous roles at Unicon with involvement in learning systems ar architecture for various clients, operations, architecture, and IT security for Unicon's hosting and managed services, and as a member of the Unicon executive team. He has over 25 years of experience in complex systems development and operations, delivering SaaS platforms and services supporting millions of customers. He will be joined by Dave Mendez, a senior cloud engineer and senior system administrator at Unicon. Dave leads a team of system administrators and cloud architects in Unicon's hosting and managed services department, where applications and their environments are provided 24 seven by 365 support. Dave currently specializes in Amazon Web Services and holds all five available AWS certifications, placing him in the elite few of AWS architects worldwide. He has over 17 years experience working with information technology in both academic and corporate environments. Our speakers welcome your questions throughout the presentation. Since you will be placed on mute during this webinar, we encourage you to use the Q&A capability to submit your questions. You can ask, access the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A icon located in the black bar menu at the top of your screen. We are recording today's webinar. You will receive an email with a link to view the recording and to download the slides. You will also be able to view the recording on Unicon's YouTube channel. And now let's proceed with our presentation. I'll turn it over to Marcus who will begin with a brief introduction to Unicon. Thanks, Joanna. Uh, just a quick touch on what we'll be covering today. First, a little bit about Unicon, and then we'll go over the goals for this webinar. After the introductory material, we'll cover the main content of today's session. Uh, as Joanna noted, we'll leave time for uh, questions and discussions at the end as well. A quick bit of background on, on Unicon. We specialize in education technology and related and supporting services. Uh, we build learning products for a number of ed tech and a lot of the major publishing firms as well. We've got deep expertise in content authoring, delivery, learning applications, assessment, both formative and summative, and learning analytics. We also help higher ed and to a lesser degree K-12 organizations deploy various open source solutions and integrate them into their broader campus or organizational technology landscape. We've been providing hosting and managed services for learning and other platforms for many years. Uh, we're running large learning workloads in AWS and have been for over seven years. A number of these workloads support millions of students and deliver their services globally. Um, in the About Us, you can see from the numbers uh, that we serve hundreds of clients and we deliver many hundreds of projects annually. In today's webinar, we're going to cover using the AWS features and capabilities to build a strong foundation for deploying and running workloads in AWS. The tools that we'll apply are critical to establishing an environment that features security, reliability, is optimized for costs, and can be run and monitored to deliver on those business functions associated with the workloads. These operating and management characteristics are really essential. Uh, if we miss out on any of these, the impact can be severe. You can imagine the kinds of security incidents or data breaches uh, that, that you might experience if we don't have a solid secure framework uh, underpinning all of this stuff. Um, challenges with the manageability and the operational excellence in ensuring we've got the right kinds of reliability and availability in the services as well. Um, and without the right governance, uh, you can have you know, cloud sprawl, you can have uh, uh, unexpected cost overruns, um, and struggle to, to meet your budgetary and other financial goals in operating the cloud as well. <clears throat> uh, our goal today is to really arm you with some information to get off to a solid start. If you are already running workloads in AWS, you can sort of use this as a bit of a health check and look for some of the special tips that we've got. Um, note that uh, what we're talking about here in terms of security, reliability, cost optimization, and operational excellence are pillars of the well-architected framework. 
Um, we'll be talking more about that framework and other pillars in upcoming sessions and content. So uh, stay tuned for that as well. Okay, so let's break this down a little and we'll start to introduce some of the AWS capabilities and services that we'll be talking about today. Uh, sort of a, a, a visual here of the steps moving from configuring the basics and establishing that strong foundation and then moving into connecting uh, resources and services together and also to the outside world. And then finally deploying the compute, storage, or other resources that you need to actually deliver the capabilities of the workload. Um, and that workload could be, you know, a relatively straightforward lift and shift of, say, a you know, small three-tier web app, you know, serving up some content or a simple application. Or that workload could be a very complex data processing and analytics workload, taking um, integrated and taking feeds from a variety of, of uh, enterprise data sources um, and running uh, data processing pipelines and moving that into various kinds of storage, running that produce jobs on them. Um, and then serving that data up to a variety of academic or administrative stakeholders. So today we're really gonna focus on these first three components, establishing a strong account presence, first of all, uh, and then configuring the identity and access management for users, defining group memberships and, and roles, uh, and then associating policies and privileges. Then lastly, we're gonna talk about setting up a strong governance, management, monitoring, and in instrumentation environment Again, speaking to that operational excellence piece. Um, we'll likely cover the virtual private cloud and associated networking concepts in our next AWS webinar and some upcoming blog posts. So again, stay tuned for those. Uh, so at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dave, uh, hand him control, and Dave's gonna dive into uh, the details here. All righty, thank you, Marcus. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Marcus pointed out, the, the first part we're gonna talk about here, and I've been setting up AWS environments for quite some time is getting the AWS account set up properly so that you are secure and that you have your your backend management working properly so that you don't have to worry about it or at least you know what is going on before you turn it over to users. Uh, one of the easiest things about AWS is that you can get in quickly and start doing your infrastructure and that is fine and dandy for quick development work but when you're really trying to keep governance and, and security in mind you need to think first about what needs to be enabled in the account and how to manage that as you move along that way you don't have to worry about things after things are getting worked on and going live so the first part of course if you're familiar with AWS is that you sign up for a free account and that is known as the root account this is your most valuable asset of AWS. It controls everything. As such, it should be treated as something very valuable to the business. Uh, the end goal here being that no one should be using the root account except designated users. It should be very limited users that have access to this account. You, For disaster purposes, recovery purposes, you should at least know that two people have always have access to it. Um, it, it, Unicom will go even with three just to make sure that if, if one goes, we still have two. So we like to make sure that you control that account very securely and, and you know who has access to that. That's the first thing you want to define when you're getting started. Uh, one of the main questions I always get is, do I do one account or do I do many accounts? Uh, what we, what we usually tell people is one account is done if you don't need to really worry about breaking up cost, you want to have a little simpler management and get started with AWS. Uh, the many accounts concept is when you have complex organizations, you may have multiple projects, multiple environments, you need to break up cost, et cetera. In that case, there is a concept known in AWS as you move into the cloud known as a landing zone. Inside that landing zone concept is a instructions for setting up a multi-account AWS environment that follows best practices. Uh, that, that we will not cover in this webinar, that, that is outside the scope of this, so we're going to focus on the one account concept. But you can always go to the many accounts concept afterwards because a lot of the principles are still used inside of this. So upon getting your AWS account going and your, your root account up and running, you're gonna log into your account. And the first thing you should do is begin to set up the IAM offering. IAM is AWS's Identity and Access Management Service. It controls 
permissions, access to AWS resources, and the services for users themselves. Um, you, when you log in and you go to the dashboard, this is the first screen you would see. And they do a very good job of telling you what your security status is right out of the bat. So the first thing that you'll want to do, first and foremost, is you do want to activate multi-factor authentication on the root account. This is a vital thing you should do. You do not want to not do this. There, there. If you've been in AWS long enough, losing your root account is devastating to a business. So definitely always activate MFA on the root account. They provide hardware appliance from Jamalto, as well as you can do virtual appliances, a, a Google Authenticator. We recommend that you stay with the hardware one uh, because if you lose a phone, that could get a little tough on on a company. The next thing you need to worry about is after that, you do the password policy. Uh, this is kind of some standard security setups for most users and most companies. You do want to set up a strong password policy that follows you know, a long password, one capital, one lower numbers, characters, password expiration, don't reuse you know, the last 10 passwords, that type of situation. So that should be the next thing you set up. That, that walks you through a wizard. If you're going through, you, you kind of click the little arrows there and they will have a button as you expand that of, of setting that up and it's very simple to do. Uh, once that's done, the next thing you do with the root account is to create an administrators group, an AWS administrators group. Again, expanding that little arrow there will put you in an area to, to set the group up. The administrators group you, you create and you apply what's called the administrator's managed policy to that. Once you have an administrator group, the next thing you do is you set up an individual user, which most likely will be your own account because you've logged in as a root account. Most people that are gonna be administrators start with the root account. So you would give, make yourself an IAM user and you would place it inside of the AWS administrator group to give you full access to the actual account to begin setting up more of these things we'll talk about today. Um, one thing with a new account is Amazon is all programmatic. So you can make any calls you see in the GUI through the programmatic access. Doing that requires an access key pair, access key and a secret key. Um, the root account, if it, in, the, in the newer accounts, you're not gonna have one. It's gonna be green like you see here. Older accounts, if you've been in AWS for a bit, they used to automatically create those. You will want to delete those. There should be no reason to keep root access keys in play. It's not a good practice, and those should always be deleted. So once you set, get through those first five things, the next thing you need to pay attention to are what are known as IAM policies. IAM policies are the backbone of what controls permissions to the AWS services and the users. Uh, what Amazon recommends and what we recommend is you always start your policies with least privileges. Only give out the actions that a resource or a user will need. These are JSON-based syntax documents. Uh, there's numerous examples of these in AWS documentation as well as anywhere who uses AWS on the web. Uh, they're applied to users, to groups, and to what are called roles. Uh, that's where you allow or deny actions to, to those resources there. Um, you do, the reason you do least privileges is that you don't want a user going in and accidentally or even maliciously executing actions that they shouldn't ex execute inside the account. It kind of controls and prevents things from happening. It follows the best practices presented by AWS and quite frankly will keep you a lot more secure if you start with least privileges. One of the first ones that we'll recommend you create and we'll discuss this in just a little bit is an IAM policy that will explicitly deny access to the CrowdTrail and AWS config offerings. Uh, you apply that to the groups that are not administrators, and you name it something very easy, something that you're able to recognize, very simple, deny access to CloudTrail, AWS configs, you know that it's an explicit deny. Well, that'll be the first step in assuring that you can keep secure records of activity in your account, as well as changes that'll occur. Um, it ex the, by doing an explicit deny in the IAM policy world, that will prevent the user from accessing these, even if another policy or group they're a member of would grant them access. Explicit deny will always trump uh, actions that are allowed. AWS follows that process. Now these, these policies here, they take practice to implement. 
and you should always test them when you're using it. AWS supplies you with a IAM policy simulator, easily found through their documentation or just a quick Google. It will let you test policies that you write or their own, a combination of policies with what calls you can make in AWS and tells you, hey, this isn't gonna work or this will work. It, it gives you an idea before you put this into action. Again, though, it does, these, these take practice and they take a little experience. So you do want to start using them, but there are two types. There are AWS managed policies, which AWS has granted. There are a lot of these and they follow good practices. Those are good to start with before you go to what's called custom policies, where you begin writing your own policies, dictating their permissions that you're going to give users and or groups. So here's some example custom IAM policies. Like we talked about, you're gonna to wanna to create a policy that denies uh, access to CloudTrail and AWS config. Uh, you could grant read-only access to those, but to start off, you know, you always want to start off with a deny and only give out the access that is needed at a, at a time as you're more familiar with how things work. Um, it's a very simple JSON syntax there. You can see that it's very small. We just deny and we deny any actions that are going to be called. Um, th this would prevent anyone from accessing CloudTrail or Config if you apply this policy to their account or their group. Uh, over here on the right is another custom policy that allows users to manage their password in the account. It's a very limited profile. It allows them to get into the IAM console and set their password. It doesn't let them change their SSH keys or do much of anything else. However, in the resources that are sitting there at the end of the presentation is a link that would give you a much more robust policy that lets users manage keys, manage their own MFA device, et cetera. Uh, it's important to note that you must allow the actions in the policy. AWS will still will always assume a deny if you don't specifically state the permission needs to be granted. Note that that's different than an explicit deny. Explicit deny will just always deny it regardless if you've granted an allow, but if you don't allow a permission like we see here in the minimal one, then you're not going to be able to execute that action inside of AWS. So once you have a little concept of policies, this is the first thing we recommend you do. Um, th this is something I've used with clients over the years and it kind of gets them started in the right direction to understand how permissions work and how you, for users and, and gets kind of segregate some duties immediately. The five groups we usually set up are an AWS administrator group, which we talked about earlier. Uh, it's the first one you'll create. And when you create this group, you are going to apply the administrator access. It's an AWS managed policy, grants full access to everything. Um, the next group you would create is an IAM admins group that would be granted full IAM access. That is, again, an AWS managed policy. It lets them come in and do everything they need to do with IAM. We, we, we define these two separate groups because we find out as, as clients move along, they, the, the full administrators usually don't want to get into IAM user management group management. So they delegate that down to the full IAM admins. But when you start out, sometimes the user account is in both of those. And, and that's okay. We just like to keep these groups separated because eventually those delegation of duties do get moved. Uh, the another group we create is called an IAM limited admins group. This will use a custom policy that we'll talk about a little later on. This allows users in this group to perform a certain functions that the full IAM admins will allow them to do for users or groups in the account. If, for example, a project manager may want to add in developers to a specific group, uh, this lets them do that without granting them full access to policies and the ability to elevate privileges. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on here. Uh, the other group we create is a billing group. This allows users to view the billing information and or management manage it if you so choose to. Um, oh, by default, the root account is what can change things in the billing. Um, as you don't want to use the root account, you want to delegate out groups to the billing. These would be more of financial people inside the company, perhaps CFOs, et cetera. You don't want them going around looking at your EC2 resources or accidentally clicking things that you shouldn't do. So we put them in a group that lets them 
handle the billing information and do reporting. The fifth group we create is an AWS users group. This is more of a default catch-all group. What we do this for is to show uh, AWS users that, hey, you have administrators, you have admins, this is where everyone else goes. We apply to that group to deny access to CloudTrail AWS config policy, and we also apply a manage your own AWS user account policy. That way, if they're in this group, we know they can't get to the security and audit information, but they can manage their own account. This is where we put users in initially, and as you grow and as you get bigger, you will end up making more groups, but these five here give you a good foundation for segregating duties, as well as staying secure and following best practices. A little example here of what the groups page looks like after you set that up. You have the admins, the billing, the users, admins, limited admin, and then over here on the right, I'll show you who's in there. Um, how you attach a policy is you simply would click the group name, AWS brings up a policy. What I'm showing here are the AWS managed ones here. You can kind of see it's just a simple click, you walk through the wizard and it'll apply it to that group. As you move along, they also provide the ability to loot to your custom policies. You simply change the filter and you can apply. Keep in mind, you can attach multiple policies to a group. That's why it's very important to understand how policies work together, where you're not denying, you, you, you assume by not doing an explicit deny in a policy that a user isn't gonna be able to execute an action because another policy could grant that if you haven't denied it. So another policy like we talked about before was a limited IAM admins policy. This is one that can get a little complex to set up and then at the end of the presentation will be a link for how to get this started for yourselves. Uh, it, it starts off just as AWS would by doing a very limited approach to what an IAM, limited IAM admin can do. In this example here that I'm showing you, I created a policy that would allow users in this group to simply add users and remove users from the AWS users group. It also only allowed them to attach a specific policy. In this case, it was EC2 full access. What you're seeing here is when someone logs in as this user and they begin to try to add users, move them in and out of the group. If for some reason one of them wanted to try to do, let's grant administrator access to this group, they would get a message up here that says, hey, you're not allowed to do that. You're only allowed to do what the full IAMs allow you to do with certain policies. Again, keeping you very secure at that point in time. This is a, a policy and group that a lot of people forget when they start out because they give it to just full IAM admin access. And you don't want to do that. You want to keep that group very limited and you want to delegate permissions out to limited IAM admins. Um, sometimes I get a lot of questions too. They'll say, Dave, I, I see all these errors in my IAM admin dashboard, the, unable to attach policies, unable to view these users. If you're seeing those, that's because you don't have permissions to it. Those are definitely okay to see if you don't want someone to see those. After you have your policies, your groups going, the next concept to understand is IAM roles. These are very important within AWS. They allow you to delegate access out to users and resources. They're crucial for handling permissions in the account. And, and quite frankly, having a solid foundation requires you to use IAM roles. Um, there's different types of roles. There are roles for resources, roles for users, roles for cross-account access. Again, outside the scope of this webinar, but they're what will allow people to assume roles to get permissions for a specific amount of time. You can't create roles without attaching a policy to them. So by default, it would have no permissions. One of the main things you will want to do first that we tell clients and when I'm setting up accounts is I will create an IAM role for use by EC2 instances. You should always launch an EC2 instance with an IAM role because the best practice is not for the code to have keys, it is for the instance to have permission to access other resources in Amazon. So for example, most of the time you'll have an application that will have resources stored in S3. The instance that needs to access S3 is given the role with permission to access that location. 
That way you're not storing credentials somewhere where you shouldn't store them. AWS handles the key rotation of roles for instances. Every hour they'll rotate those keys. And that way you're following a best practice inside of that. Roles are used not just for EC2, they're used for Lambda functions, API gateway, any resource that needs to interact with another service, roles are used for. And they're applied, you apply a policy to them just like you do a group. So you only give permission to the role for what it needs to do inside of the account. Um, they can to be granted and revoked. So if, if a role, you, you have a, a, another account that you may want to access your AWS resources, if you need to cut permissions off immediately, you can easily just change the policy on that role and they can't access. So it's a, it's, it provides a, a secure way to handle permissions and to easily grant and revoke permissions for outside of users and groups. So when you're finished all of this up, you will have on your dashboard, you should see five greens in your secure IM configuration. Um, you should have your root access keys deleted. You should have MFA activated on your root account and, and you're using groups and roles and permissions and policies to handle access to your situation. Right now, note too, you have not turned this over to users yet. This is this is a, a, the person who's created a root account, has made them an administrator, and they are working through this, getting this set up. So you have a foundation in place before you turn it over for how you will handle access to resources inside of your system here. And this is a good point here where if you see these greens that you're coming to the point where you want to check certain things. So in the IM thing, you always start with least privileges, you review your groups, your roles to make sure that's the approach you're taking. Uh, you do want to stay rigorous about granting permissions. It is very easy inside of AWS to simply say, hey, you know what, give them full access to EC2 and S3 and let them do what they need to do to get their job done. As, as we all know, and I've been in projects, sometimes you just are trying to get work done, stay rigorous because it is very easy to forget you have given those permissions out. And it can do a, a very cloud sprawl in terms of who can access what and, and it takes you out of being more secure and staying strong in your foundation. Um, you can still review your IAM setup by following the best practices in AWS documentation. That involves a key pair rotation strategy, which is also outside the scope of what we would get into for details but keys are actually used programmatically by developers, by, by uh, roles to do things. And you want to rotate those following a good secure practice. One thing to note when you are reviewing your IAM setup is the administrator group, your IAM full admins group, and even your limited IAM admins group should use MFA. They need to be they, they're considered privileged users and you so they should also be using multi-factor authentication. Um, there are some companies that just make everyone use MFA and there's nothing wrong with that. But at the very least, please do ensure your administrators, your IAM admins, your, your privileged users are enabling MFA to using their account. That keeps you even more secure. Little tip that we use, and I'll talk about these two, these, uh, these couple of these services as we move forward, is you can use CloudTrail, AWS Config, and CloudWatch events to help monitor your IAM setup. For example, you can tell if CloudTrail has been turned off. You can tell if someone was added to an administrator group or a policy was changed. You, you can get notifications about these. Another thing to monitor your IAM is there are things called the Access Advisor and Credential Report that are available in the console. The Access Advisor shows you if for a group or a user, what permissions are granted to them and what they're accessing when they last access it. So the service name, the policy that allows them to do that and the last time they did that. The credential report will give you a report of all of the accounts users and the status of those credentials, time created, the time the password was last used, the time the access key was last rotated used. Utilize those in a, in a routine manner to keep track of what's going on inside the account. So once you get through the IAM process, you're in a nice foundation to begin moving on forward with the other services that you want to activate in the account. Again, the next one we would talk about is CloudTrail. If you're not familiar with Cloud, CloudTrail, CloudTrail is a service that records a history of all API calls, API calls made in the account. So anything that someone does, launches an instance, changes the policy, it is a log for security analysis, it changed tracking. You want this enabled. 
So after you've set up your IM and even before you go to that, you could go flip on CloudTrail as a root user. Um, there are a couple things to understand when you set up CloudTrail. Uh, they call they call the the log a trail, and turning on is very simple. It's going to the service and turning logging on. So it's a little flip of the switch button there. The first thing you do want to do is you want to have CloudTrail on for all regions, and you'd like to deliver that to a single bucket. That way, if something happens in a region you're not using, you, you can get notification for those. You'd like to enable log file validation as well as encrypt those log files. Uh, by default, AWS will use a server-side encryption in S3 for log files, but you can even get more directly manageable and utilize their key management service should you so choose. But the main thing I want to stress is have this on. If it's not on, on, it's a mistake it needs to be on uh, one of the options is to also enable CloudTrail to send logs to the CloudWatch log service so that you can easily also look for certain things you you'd want to see in a log whether it's adding into a group it, it also allows you to see the read only actions that happen so as you can see it's a very important log keeping activity inside the account and you should guard access to this, which is why we deploy the CloudTrail policy that denies access to it on the default users group. This is a little example of what it shows. This is the GUI interface to CloudTrail. You can see here on this date, I was turning it on. I started doing some config rules. I was looking, running some evalu evaluations with AW config, and John Doe, who is an administrator, created a new policy. The GUI shows you create, modify, and delete. It won't show you read-only calls. That's done in CloudWatch logs. That's why we recommend putting it to that as well. As since we deny it, it goes without saying that CloudTrail should also, with the guarding, again, I want to stress, only allow people you want to see this information see it. Don't open that up. Get to that. Now, the next service you turn on after CloudTrail is you go to AWS Config. AWS Config will be able to provide you an inventory of all of your AWS resources and the ability to record those configurated changes that happen to them over time. It's essential for governance, monitoring, security. Uh, you always enable it, and the first time you enable it, again, like CloudTrail, it's very simple. You go to the service, and you, you flip to turn it on. It'll ask you a few questions, such as, do you want me to record all your global resources, which is your IAM type things? You do do that for the first time you activate config in the region you will be using. You don't do that for all regions. It is region specific, which means you have to turn it on for each region, but only one of them should be recording the global activity there. Um, it uses what's called config rules for what to check. And I'm going to move forward here to show you what those are. So AWS provides you with some predefined rules that tell the config service, what am I looking for? What am I checking? The first one you always should enable is if CloudTrail is enabled. That way config can tell you if you're compliant or not. Did you turn CloudTrail on? You can see if it, it's very simple. You would you search for it inside when you add a rule. You enable the CloudTrail. It'll ask you a couple questions, and then it will run an evaluation. And then you can always look at your rules. It will tell you which ones are compliant. Right. So the first thing you should always enable, check the cloud trails on and running in the account. That should be the first rule you do. Another rule that we use and that we recommend is that you also use a required tags rule. Uh, tagging is a way to identify resources in the account. It's used to help isolate out costs, isolate out projects, etc. One of these rules I did here was a required tags, and I I configure it to say, I'd like to know if I have an environment tag on there to tell me if it's production, development, et cetera. I put that configuration in. Again, very easy to set up. It would come in and tell me, it runs the evaluation, hey, you have one resource that is not compliant, and I can go fix that and address that. You can also set up some automation to handle some of these things. One thing that is not shown here in the screenshot is that config will also show you the resources, as I mentioned before. You would do that by clicking the resources here on the left side of these menus, and it would bring up, say, all of your EC2 instances that are running, and are they compliant with all rules you have defined? So it does provide you with that, that aspect to see what is running in the account, and are you compliant with what you're, you're doing? Start with predefined rules first until you understand what's going on. You can then use to custom rules, and there's excellent documentation on that, but that does take some experience to also write 
uh, rules you'd like to get into are, do you have security groups that are open to the world? Are you allowing an instance to be accessed from everywhere when it shouldn't be? Or at least review if you have that like that. So again, AWS Config, a valuable service that you should have turned on as well at all times. Again, all this is happening before you turn it over to the users. Next part that you want to do is CloudWatch logs. This is will provide a centralized log collection service for your applications, your workloads, as well as your offerings that you may be using in AWS CloudTrail Lambda. It's very easy to set up. It is part of the CloudWatch service, which is AWS's free, you know, not free monitoring service, but they activate and give you 10 free checks for EC2 resources, RDS, et cetera. Um, Part of that is cloud watch logs. It's very easy to set up. An agent goes on to an EC2 resource and you simply begin configuring it with a very simple setup that will send its system logs to cloud watch logs. Cloud trail integrates automatically with cloud watch logs once you activate it. So it'll begin sending logs to cloud trail. So a little example of what it is. When you get into CloudWatch, you're going to see CloudWatch logs. This is a little EC2 instance I set up. It's putting its var log messages, a Linux box, into CloudWatch logs. You keep them centralized. They're off the box. So that way, if something ever happens to the box, you have a copy of the logs. You can do many things with once the logs are in here, which is a benefit of this. You can expire the logs after a certain day or keep them infinitely. It's completely up to you to control costs in that manner. You can also set up alerts or metrics based on an instance. So if you're looking for an out of memory error in an application or something isn't working right inside, you want to look at a cloud trail action that may have occurred. You can set up alerts in CloudWatch that will notify you that these are going on, which makes this a very valuable centralized logging situation for you to use. Again, very easy to set up. Most people I do start off with doing these for EC2 instances. And then they, as they've moved CloudTrail, as we said before, you activate that to go to CloudTrail, CloudWatch logs. You can begin seeing how these logs pile up and move forward. And it's, it's a very useful service. Again, you can, with IAM policies, limit who can do what, whether you let them access a certain log area or not. So the next thing we set up is the billing alerts. This helps you control your costs across the, across the account. Um, the billing alerts are set up where you may or may not want to spend money inside. You want to know if you're going to go over budget for a, for a month inside the account. So you, you, you may want to spend more than $400 a month. You can set up alerts inside of the billing console to tell you, or by delivering to an SNS topic, a simple notification that, Hey, you're about to go over. It will do it in real time. So if you're if they calculate that you're going to go over the next day, you're going to know that immediately. You can take actions to do this. You should define a group permitted to, as we said, to see the billing information. But you'll also want to set up who should get those alerts, and and that is easily done through the the console there. You do. There are two things you can set up when working with billing. You may have full billing access. You could have just view billing access. Um, that is done, one or two groups as needed there. We create only one initially so that you understand you need to isolate that type of access. And, and But you can easily go to a view billing part to allow others to just see the information so that you know, maybe a project manager needs to see, oh, I am running high EC2 for these areas right here. A thing that they do provide in the billing is to utilize Cost Explorer. Take care of that and use that. That will show you what your expenses are you in the account are going to, how much S3 was used. And, and those help you with some prediction models. So after you've set all this up, you're, you're on a solid foundation. Again, you still haven't turned it over to users yet. Um, some additional setups you'd want to consider, maybe you want to add in more config rules, extra tags, who owns these resources, look for those. Um, get to know CloudWatch. It, it's their, it, their standard metrics that are active already. You're going to want to understand those and how to do custom metrics. It's good to have that information as you start to grow. The next thing you want to learn about is CloudWatch events. That's critical for what's known now as event-driven security. See what happens in the account and take appropriate actions inside of it to handle these things automatically for you. So at that point, that at this point, we, we're kind of through the first part of what Marcus was talking about there, the blue arrow there. You've turned over the account. The, the account can, is ready to be turned over for users to start using. You, you should have a solid foundation there 
for being able to manage permissions, recording activity, seeing if things are compliant in your account, et cetera. It, it, it's ready to be used here. One thing to note is that your usage will change. So as things go, you're gonna add groups, you're gonna change policies, you're gonna take away rules or add rules based on how you begin to understand how AWS is used and how your business is using it. One thing to note is never be stagnant. AWS is always changing. They are very good at adding features in, services, offerings, you name it, they will be adding it. And it's it, you have to stay vigilant in reviewing your foundation that things work or take advantage of new features. They, they, they may add something to CloudTrail that you're gonna to wanna to take advantage of. So don't be stagnant, always stay strong with it. As I said, everyone's different. Every client I've worked with has a different need for using AWS, but these things we've talked about today get you on a foundation to understand access, how to control it, and how to monitor these things. So with that here, there are some resources that are in that, are, that, that I've put in here in the slide that you can definitely see on, on a recording of it. The best practices, the config rules, the IAM administrators, the limited one, how to get started with these things. Each thing's here. Definitely look at this full AWS Manage Own User Account Policy. That's something most likely you will add once you understand how these things are working. So with that, that, that concludes that portion there. We'll open up to Q&A and um, we'll turn it back over to Joanna when we close out. Okay, I don't see any questions coming in. I'll allow just a few more seconds to see if any questions come in. Um, and if not, we'll conclude. Um, well, contact information for our speakers is listed on the current slide. If you think of any questions after this webinar that you would like addressed, please feel free to email Dave or Marcus. On behalf of our speakers and myself, thank you all for joining us today. You can visit our website, unicon.net, to learn more about our services for AWS. As a reminder, we will be providing you with a link to view the webinar recording and to download the slides within the next few days. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.